Serenby is a place where people live, work, learn, and play in celebration of life's beauty. And we're here to share the stories that connect residents and guests to each other and to nature. This is Serenby Stories. Steve, welcome back to Serenby Stories. Thank you. We're at our next episode, and our episode is going to focus on how to build a neighborhood from scratch. Can't be that hard, right? One of the conversations we were having is we hear a lot about sort of, I don't know if it was a fateful day or evening, when you sat down with Ray C. Anderson, and he is known for, in his book and in his life, of how the work that he did was pushing himself through a threshold of saying, if not you, who, and if not now, when? And he asked that same question to you, And you've always told me that was the moment that you decided you had to go do this thing. But actually, the question really I want to ask you is, is that the moment that you decided? (laughs) Or was that when you realized you needed to go save the land? And so the question I want to ask you is, when did you realize it wasn't just about saving the 40,000 acres and all this land around you, but you're like... I'm going to build a neighborhood on my land. Like, how did you, when did, that seems like a really big decision. How did that come to you? Well, when we think about the moment, we're thinking about 60 seconds. And that 60 second moment never happened. But it was over that gradual course of time. Mm Mm-hmm. And suddenly I realized how far I'd come down that path of willingness to actually use our own land Mm, to develop. Okay. So this began, which I've talked about, it was to save my backyard. I started buying it. You know, that's a normal thing. What can I do? I'm going to buy it. I'm going to control it. Right. And and that was the first impression, Mm -hmm. you know. And, and, And so the first... Aha was um, I couldn't buy enough to really save us. Okay, and 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 that's when I was talking to Ray Anderson, Mm -hmm. and so then he brought these thought leaders in, and and I felt that that was not doing anything except frustrating me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Looking back, I can see that was the next moment. Mm -hmm. That that was the moment of my first thought process that a lot of things are broken Mm -hmm. and how I I guess my personality is a fixer. Okay. Uh, You you know, it's to, well, well, why is it broken? Right. And uh, so so I was frustrated at that time. I realized that started those questions in my mind. Okay. Um, And then I think at that point I was thinking, well, I could build because I think I've talked about the Ryan Ganey piece, that he was wanting to develop a street to show a better way to do this. Oh, interesting. And because Ryan was such a character, I tried helping him find land at least 10 miles away from me. (laughs) Uh, But then when I I felt that the development pressure was there, one of my first thoughts was, well, if I'm going to have houses in my backyard, I'd rather have houses inspired by Ryan Ganey than a track builder. Right. So there were these little pieces that were that were landing at various places okay. in my consciousness. Okay. And then through my frustration on all these specialists that I had been introduced to the Rocky Mountain Institute, whether it was water, whether it was, you know, agriculture. Okay. Um, that Ray suggested I go visit the Rainies outside Chicago mm-hmm. in Prairie Crossing. Okay. And of course, they, in an effort to change and to preserve their family land, mm-hmm. they were the first place I had seen the the ratio of develop 30% and save the majority of okay. it. So that, that was my first piece to that. And that is when I said, we're not thinking large enough. We need to bring the bigger community together. Mm-hmm. And as I was stepping through that idea of just trying to bring it, at this point, I wasn't going to be the leader. Okay. And through that process, I realized, well, if I'm saying it's so good, I need to develop my own land to show us an example. Mm-hmm. 
And so you can see the moments added up. Right. And, you know, I, I, I think I remember one of those, those days. In fact, uh, it's, it's captured uh, to a degree with the USA Today story that they did on it because they had heard about us. And, oh. and uh, uh, when the first bulldozer rolled up and they came out and, and, and I think that was one of my first times that I had realized the moments had, had added up. And oh my God, I was going to really be doing this development. Uh, although there was another moment, I, I think the sobering moment when I realized I was going to do this and that I was going to have to borrow money to do it mm-hmm. was the dinner I had with the girls one night. And it was, it was realizing that I come through a period of seven years where I was very financially secure because mm-hmm. I had sold the company. Right. We could do anything we wanted. Right. And I was in that wonderful period. Mm-hmm. And suddenly the banks were requiring me to put all of that up mm-hmm. as collateral. Right. And so I had moved money into accounts for the girls' education. Okay. And at dinner I talked to them that uh, if we were really going to move forward to be an example of what could happen, that we were going to have to leverage all of our holdings and all of our income from Mm -hmm. real estate. And I wanted their blessings. And I remember that was a really big deal Mm -hmm. to me. Right. That, and of course, you know, they said, sure, dad. (laughs) And um, as they've talked about it now, uh, it's not quite as monumental in their minds because (laughs) dad wants to build houses. And he said, he said, it's okay. Okay. But, but uh, so they they went along, but uh, for for me, that was, that was a sobering moment Mm -hmm. that we were going to do it. And Mm -hmm. we were going to financially put ourselves on the line. Right. Then I remember when the bulldozers actually showed up to start taking (laughs) trees down where we had staked these roads that we had walked that, oh my God, this was happening. (laughs) But you know, Monica, even today, there's many times, especially when we have visitors here and I'm giving a tour Mm -hmm. and, and I just go down the streets and I see what was here. And I think, how on earth did I ever think we could really do, do this? this. <laughs> oh my God. So, so I still have those moments that, oh, wow, you know, yeah. and, and then when I have the stories from a family, how their life yeah. has changed yeah, or we have a developer or a policymaker, like, like the biophilic leadership summit that's just yeah. here. These are leaders from various and by being on this land and seeing that this this isn't complicated, right? That I realize what a big deal this is turning out to be, and so those moments are constantly happening to me. Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, and it's constantly pushing us to do the next thing, to fight to make sure the next thing happens, and do more. Yeah. So how do you build a neighborhood from scratch? So now we now understand sort of all those little pieces that came together. I mean. What do you do? Do you hire an architect or a land planner or a consultant or what? Do, and I, what do you do? You stake the land and bring some bulldozers in, but somebody had to do some planning. So, what's the first step? Well, the first step when we were doing this is okay. Who who is going to be the land planner? You know, who, who are all the people you need? Now, because we. We're leading with environmental. Mm -hmm. The number one environmental land planner was Mm -hmm. a man named Robert Marvin. Robert Marvin, okay. And Mr. Marvin lived in uh, South Carolina. Okay. Was known for uh, uh, planning some of the major conservations, such as Braze Island. He did the restoration of the waterfront at Buford. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there were many of these wonderful environmental communities. Mm -hmm. And so we contacted Mr. Marvin Mm -hmm. and talked with him, flew down uh, to his home. And I I remember him uh, taking us into his home and we were on the way to the Southern Country Club to have lunch. And he said, let's stop and pick up my wife because he had this wonderful Southern draw. Mm -hmm. And we stopped at his house and I said, well, Mr. Marvin, this is, this is amazing. I thought, boy, that, you know, because the back of the house was all glass. It was, from the front, it was just this simple little neighborhood house. But you walked in and the whole back had obviously been taken off and it was all glass. Wow. And there was stone. And he said, yes. He said, I, uh, I dug the floors all out. And he said, there is 20 inches 
of, of rock, and, and, and then there was slabs of stone on top of that for the floors with oriental rugs on it. Uh-huh. And then the back was all glass, and he was doing, he was explaining all these things, how it was energy, and I thought, wow, this was really progressive for the 70s. You know, it was very mm-hmm. much what we were doing in the 70s. Like, when did you do this, Mr. Marvin? He said, when I came back from World War II in 1948. What? <laughs> and so this, th- this, this was the incredible person. And so when, when we engaged him, he says, well, Steve, I'm going to take this on, but it's probably the last thing I'll ever do. Oh. He was 80 years old. Wow. And as it turned out, it is the last thing he touched. Now, Mr. Marvin and his team would come in, and we met every six weeks, mm-hmm. and we would in the morning, have a discipline that we wanted to bring in. Okay. So this is when we brought in people in the arts community to talk about what it would be like to have artists and programming. What would that be like? Okay. If we were going to include agriculture, what were we going to do with agriculture, with education? Mm -hmm. And as we were building these various disciplines, an expert that would talk Mm -hmm. to us in the morning, and then we would talk about the land and what we were doing. And so Mm -hmm. we went through all the, the surveys. We did archaeological digs. We did all these things on the land that we were building up to actually landing a plan. Mm -hmm. And so there was a key meeting that Mr. Marvin and his team were going to finally locate houses on all these maps and where we were Mm -hmm. going to do it. Now, Now, Mr. and Marvin and I had been having these wonderful professional discussions struggles tug mm-hmm. of war now now i was this novice developer mm-hmm. but i was responding to the wonderful cluster communities that we'd seen throughout europe mm-hmm. we of course had already been seduced by the english uh, land laws and and that english pattern which mm-hmm. is which is what we had based all of our zoning on right and so i had this idea of the clustered communities mm-hmm. uh, mr marvin had come from you know decades of creating environmental communities which is really more of a uh, what i thought of sprawl uh, oh. y- you know it, it, it's houses uh, you know along waterfronts but they're they're sort of spread out mm-hmm. and it, it was a, it was more of a, it was a pure preservation really rather than the balanced okay. density and preservation. Okay. So we were having these struggles about what I thought should go on the land and how he thought it should be mm-hmm. developed. So I knew this first time was going to be one of these really roll up your sleeve and let's move things around kind of things. Mm-hmm. Well, Mr. Marvin went into the hospital and so his team brought the, the things. It was at this meeting that we had connected with a sacred geometrist uh-huh. through the Rocky Mountain Institute and his name was Phil Tabb. Uh-huh. He had also did his doctorate on the English village system and uh, was currently teaching at Washington State. And so he did a complete presentation. It was one of those magical moments when Mm -hmm. you know someone's talking the same language. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is is 2002, I guess, maybe one. Mm -hmm. And um, he... You know, at that point, we had carousels with slides in them that you dropped in. You know, I remember. <laughs> Very familiar you know, with those, so yes. far. It's amazing <laughs> when know. you think about these things, how far we are in just the time that, 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 that this started. And uh, about his, his his third slide was of the, the, the street and the house where our dear friend Alice lived in Selborne, England. And one of the villages he had studied was Selborne, England, which, which had inspired us. <laughs> and we had been visiting Alice every year in that whole wow. seven years of retirement. And so it, it was just sort of those Something. magical mm-hmm. moments that were going on. So we immediately hit out. And so we had this, this wonderful morning talking about sacred geometry and English villages mm-hmm. and, and what have you. We had lunch and then the time comes. It felt like the, the drums were rolling and, and Mr. Marvin's team, sad that he wasn't there, but they had all the paperwork and mm-hmm. they rolled it out. Well, the, the, the lead staff person obviously knew it wasn't quite right because the perspiration, by, by the time he finished an hour presentation, Aww. it wasn't just a little perspiration. You could have taken his entire shirt. Oh, no. And, and it was one of those presentations where it was so not right that there was dead silence. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I had envisioned a time we were going to roll up, say, well, let's move this here and this is it. And it was just like... I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I don't know where to start. <laughs> and, and, and it was that awkward moment of no questions, no conversations, and said, oh, 
well, let's take a break. (laughs) (laughs) And, And it's just like, oh my gosh. And so Phil and I walked out into the garden and then on towards the woods. And Phil said, I know what you want. I can do this. Interesting. And this, while I had talked on the phone, this is my first time of really being with Phil, that we were mm-hmm. together. And so we walked and talked a little bit more. And, uh, of course, we, we we came back and regrouped. And and I said, well, I, I don't think this is right. Let, let's pick up someplace else. And, uh, of course, two other people, we had v- various professionals there. Two mm-hmm. other people called me and said, I know what you want. Sure. Uh, <laughs> We can do this. Of yeah. It was so obvious that this wasn't going to go on with Mr. Marvin. Aww. But so I had three different people then that were telling me we Offering were Offering up their help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I called Phil and I said, Phil, I've, I've thought about it and come back. Let's, let's have a charrette and let's see what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And so we, we planned a time. Phil came back. He and I walked the entire property and we had a three day charrette of pulled various people in. Mm-hmm. And, um, the drawings that we made from that shred are basically what we're building today. Well, and I was at Phil's house the other day because we're in the process of asking Phil to do, you know, an updated master plan that shows kind of everything rather than the phases. And he showed me some of those maps. So we'll get photos and put those on the website as well. They're absolutely beautiful. And Phil has a beautiful hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, all hand drawn, yeah. Had come basically from academia, mm-hmm. had never been thought of as a planner. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was an architect yeah. and, and understand the principles. And so it's been a, a, a wonderful relationship as he stepped into being our land planner. And then, of course, once you come up with a plan, uh, we had to find a civil engineer. Okay, so that's the next and step. And interviewing all the civil engineers. Mm-hmm. And of course, I was this wacko uh, <laughs> restaurateur <laughs> that had these wild ideas and you could tell you know uh, they were rolling their eyes when I was talking about what we were going to do and probably once they saw Phil's because knowing what Phil's plan is they were like and do you want to like just give a visual real quickly like Phil's plan is not based on a grid a traditional grid it's based on sacred geometry which are these beautiful well, as, as we came up with this, you know, it, it, it's, it's, and, and, and sacred geometry, we could do a whole session on what mm, sacred maybe geometry is. Maybe we need to get Phil is, in here and do that. And that would be good because, mm-hmm. because it's, it's the absolute balance of numbers. Mm-hmm. When you see some of the great ancient architecture, mm-hmm. the pyramids, they did not have engineering schools. <laughs> the, the, this is the, the, the really the sacred art of how do things fit together? What's mm-hmm. the balance? Mm-hmm. Uh, it also relates to an energy force in the universe. Mm-hmm. And this maybe sounds new age when I hear myself saying that. Yet you look at the farmer's almanac. Uh, I talk to any of the old time farmers here if they're going to drill a well. Uh, they get a divining rod. They understand that there's there's a, a connection between minerals and and the earth. So there is an energy field we do not totally understand. Mm -hmm. If you look at any leaf, any pattern in nature, it's a perfect geometric balance. There's, there's a lot of math involved going on out there. Mm -hmm. So, so sacred geometry is, is really a more of a mathematical Mm -hmm. balancing effort. And so as we then sat down, there's no one pattern. It's not like you have a sacred geometry book and you choose the pattern. Right, right. It's, it, it's you really open yourself to see and to understand nature. Okay. And how can you work and develop with nature? Mm-hmm. And we've come through a period, and especially new urbanists, which I mean, that, that's an imp- imposition upon nature. It's really scraping nature without any uh, concern about what's there Mm -hmm. and then imposing the built environment on the land. Okay. If you're looking at sacred geometry, we're really talking about understanding nature Mm -hmm. and trying to understand how we could introduce housing and commercial into the pattern. 
So as as Phil and I walked the the, the land for a, a week before the charrette, we had both been in Italy within the year, mm-hmm. and so we were both seduced by the Italian hill towns. Okay. And so as we talked about the various ridges, he and I were talking about all the hill town ideas that we could do. Uh-huh. Then when we sat down to the actual charrette with other people and started looking at the actual maps and how we could put streets uh, on the land and talked about a lot of the concepts that we wanted. We realized that the, the ridge caps were wonderful, but how much better it would be if we kept those as open spaces for everyone. It it more felt the philosophy that we were trying to bring uh, about an, a, an open place that connected everyone to nature rather than a few that could afford the very expensive lots that mm-hmm. sat on top. Sure. And, and now when I think about it and, and I see other places where they've placed the houses on the tallest hill uh, from the rows, you, you had these, these, uneven teeth that are sticking up <laughs> through the nature. Mm-hmm. And you look at Serenby, whether it's from air or the roads, uh, it's still a forest. Mm-hmm. And you can clearly see that we have placed our, our, our buildings and our roads in nature, in relationship with nature, rather than allowing nature to exist around the structures. Mm-hmm. And that becomes very obvious of uh, of a tradition for the last several decades of just imposing buildings onto the nature. Um, and, you know, most places scrape all the trees and start over. And, right. and uh, we can talk more about uh, how utility companies were trying to force me to do that very thing. Oh. Uh, so it, it, we are just in, in a tradition of how we develop, mm-hmm. and it, it has not been thoughtful, nor have we understood the unintended consequences. And I believe that's starting to come to a head here as we approach 2020. Mm-hmm. There's just several people starting to realize that we cannot keep doing it in this manner. Yeah, we need to make a change. So did you immediately stumble upon a simple engineering firm, or was that a big search? No, it was it was a large search, and we hired an initial company, and and it was a struggle. Mm-hmm. That uh, engineering company only left us with us for a year, mm-hmm. and we started looking again. Mm-hmm. So, so you don't always get it right the first time, mm-hmm. and, and it was for various reasons. Mm-hmm. Then we we hired um, uh, Southeast Engineering. Uh, mm-hmm. Chad Apple, and they're still our civil engineers today. How many years later? And so this is yeah. some, what, 16, yeah. 17 years later, they are, are still there. And uh, and now they have their office. And, and now they have moved their environmental office here to mm-hmm. Serenby. And, and and I'm sure a, a conversation with, with Chad, and, and he could share in, in his very engineering eyes uh, what it was like when <laughs> when, when I started talking about Steve what we Nigren. wanted to do here. Yes. <laughs> so you've got a land planner, you've got a civil engineer. Um, what's next? Well, so then Architects we, or? well, we're, no, we're. No, not yet. Okay. We're, we're, <laughs> well, we're working with a civil engineer and so mm-hmm. then we're doing all the drawings. Okay. And then at this point, you're having to interface with the various things like the gas company, the okay. power company, you know, AT and T, Comcast, uh-huh. the drinking water, the wastewater, all of these uh, things. That sits is, all underneath that. This okay. is all Makes at sense. that point when you mm-hmm. figure out what your entire infrastructure is going to be like. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is where granite curves. We decided, I, you know, I wanted granite curves because you just don't see them. Uh-huh. So this is in those those engineering plans of what we were going to build is when all these things happen. So, of course, mm-hmm. we're having these exciting meetings and I'm pushing and pulling what we want. And mm-hmm. They're telling me, well, I don't know if we can get that permitted. So, of course we can because it's the right <laughs> way to do it. Well, then I found out how hard sort of those of course we can are. Right. But I, I thought... And won almost every battle. Okay. Uh, we had a complete design uh, that we would harvest the rainwater off of every building 
and where we have the downspouts now that, mm-hmm. that, that, that take it into stormwater, we were going to collect that and pump it up to a purifying station. Oh, wow. And we had specified a big water tower that would have had big serenby, would have sat right over oh, here uh, to the uh, northeast <laughs> of us on a, uh, on a hill. Uh-huh. Uh, and we had identified where three wells would go to be the backup. And we were going to be our own uh, uh, water? water source. Wow. <clears throat> and both uh, EPD and uh, Atlanta, because we're in the Atlanta distribution mm-hmm. area, they both fought me. And it was one that, you know, was, as we were fighting all these battles, it was one that I was going to have to fight on two fronts. Mm-hmm. And uh, at that point, uh, they required uh, Atlanta to run a water line to us. So where if, if I had been begging for it, they would have probably charged me. Uh-huh. But where I had another alternative, oh. uh, I was able to say that's a hardship they were imposing. Oh. And so they negotiated that it would be run at no cost to me. Oh, that's nice of them. So, so it was one of those. <laughs> it was one of those. Uh, right. It's, it's one of those. About, but we own all the infrastructure and mm-hmm. now we are a bulk buyer at a meter at the road mm-hmm. rather than individuals. And my hope is one day in the future, we will actually be able to do that. Mm-hmm. In fact, one of our geothermal wells, I think, would support the entire community. We hit a water vein. Mm. Um, and just uh, seven miles from us, uh, one of the landowners back 20 years ago when we were doing all this, he was sure there were mineral rights and oil under all this. And so he brought in an oil rig from Texas uh, to find a test well. Uh. And they they uh, went deeper and deeper and deeper and they never found oil, but they found a water source that supposedly could uh, supply about 300,000 people. Unbelievable. It's a river. that right. they, they, they tapped into a river. Wow. Uh, so that could supply and, and all like, Chat Hills. It, it, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Our, our entire city here yeah. could, could, could be on that water source. So, so I think, uh, stay tuned. Those are all <laughs> things <tuned>. that, that <laughs> could happen in the future. Tell me real quickly the Granite Curb story, because that is one of my favorites. I do recall you wanting the Granite Curbs going up to this, I don't know, up in uh, at downtown Atlanta and they told you no. Well, well, this is again when when I was close to just having everything done, and, and, mm-hmm. and I think we'd already started, but I'd gone down and and I was picking up uh, another level of permits, and mm-hmm. and I'm at Fulton County's headquarters down in uh, downtown Atlanta, and he said, "There's there, there's one more thing that that, that we missed. We're not going to be able to give you the permit today." And I said, "Well, what could that be?" And he said, "Your granite curbs." And I said, "Well." What's wrong with granite curbs? And I, I remember stepping to the window and I said, "Look at they're 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 all over down here." Mm-hmm. He said, "Well, it's not that there's nothing wrong with them, but no one has put a granite curb in for thirty years, and we do not have a profile on how it should be installed, and so I can't approve these." Unbelievable. <laughs> without a profile, so we had to go back. Mm-hmm have our profile on installation approved by the county public works department Unbelievable. as a standard way to install granite curbs. And then once that came down, they could check that box and I could get my permit. But now we're seeing them everywhere. They're back in style, if you will. Right. But if you hadn't pushed that, it still would be like, well, we just don't do them. That's correct. And then most developers just accept that and move on. So Steve, we've talked about infrastructure and for somebody like myself who just I don't live in that world. I mean, I, I live in a community here. Obviously there's infrastructure underground here, you know, talking holistically about it is really interesting. And so we talked a little bit about wastewater and how you have to get a connection to all these different things and think about that when you're building a community. And one of the parts of um, infrastructure I wanted to ask you about specifically was power. You know, when you're going to put in power, when a company comes out to put in power, it's not just connecting my house. It's this whole community. So what happens? There is so much. And if you look at um, the section of motto that we are just converting now, Mm -hmm. From trees to dirt to rocks, right. it starts. You can start to imagine all that has to happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so all of your utilities are a key piece. Right. And uh, in Georgia, we allow all the utilities to have separate trenches. 
That's interesting. So just imagine the uh, power company wants to come do their trench. Mm -hmm. And this is presuming you've already moved to get them to go to underground. I'll I'll come back to that. But we absolutely require that. We don't want these poles. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gas has always been underground. Mm -hmm. And they have to be a certain number of feet from the power or on the opposite side of the street. Okay, that makes sense. And and then you have your 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 sewer or wastewater mm-hmm. that you have to run down through there. And then you have your drinking water. Right. And that all has to be separated. And then you have Comcast, AT&T, whatever your internet service is. Mm-hmm. So just think about all these trenches that are underground. And none of them cooperate with one another. Huh. And they all insist on their own equipment coming in to do this work. Uh-huh. And it becomes quite challenging in engineering this. So before we ever turn the first spade of dirt, this is all engineered through civil engineers okay. to make sure where the lines are, how far they are from each other, where the intersections are, and if they intersect, how many feet above or below are they? So just imagine, this, wow. is, a, this is an interconnected maze of lines that provide this seamless, seemingly seamless uh, functioning of a community or right. a house. Right. Uh, so, so, so that kind of sets the stage of all the different things. So after the civil engineers have all these um, drawings together, mm-hmm. and then we send those to all the utilities, the, these are mostly all public utilities, okay. then we have to have a coordinating meeting to make sure that everyone then has to work together and, oh, and, wow. and, and, and and who's going first, who's in the dirt first, oh because they won't come in at the same time. So this all has to be scheduled time-wise. And does somebody want to go first? Is that uh, a big oh, deal? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, let me think. <laughs> you know, and, and it varies, but yeah. Uh, everybody wants to be last because oh. then they don't have to... <laughs> Then they're the last in. Right. They don't have to worry about somebody else hitting their lines that oh. they have to come out. So I think it's kind of a, 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 a an agreement that if if one utility hits another, we're sorry, but you have to fix it because I don't, you know. Right. We don't get involved in, in that, but they seem to have that worked out amongst okay. themselves. So, so this is why a lot of people think, well, I'm going to do a better job than anybody else, so I'd rather be last. Okay. But... So this is just the coordination of all this. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, we had, on this first phase, now I am a um, uh, novice developer, Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, okay, we've we've done that. Everybody now has left their meeting, and everybody knows what they're going to do. Right. Well, what we really didn't have on the plans, which, or, or they just didn't, forced me to was was the the elevation so the power company for instance expected me to have a perfectly flat so the plans they were looking at they expected it to all be flat oh. because everywhere you go that's what you see and i said no no we're not going to grade this natural area in fact we're going to leave some of these big trees right here oh no <laughs> Well, nobody was. Nobody dead. wants that. You know, th- th- that wasn't even brought up at the meeting because that wasn't expected. Right, because nobody. Because nobody was doing that. So this was this was just. Right. So they're like, what's this crazy man out in the woods yeah, yeah. leaving so, all the so, trees so, up? So, so they're ready to start the first <laughs> trench and they want to know when I'm going to have this all leveled for them. And so they said, well, they, they couldn't do it unless I leveled 20 feet on each side for all these various of the, trenches. Of that, the road. Of the road. So you have to clear wow. 20 feet on each side. Wow. Because they each have to put in their own trench and they each have their own equipment on big wheels that comes through and does that, you know, and, and they're used to going on flat. They can't go at a 90 degree angle uh-huh. like some of our hills out right. there that you, that you see on mm-hmm. in Selborne. And so I said, we, we, we aren't going to do that. Well, we can't put your power lines in. <laughs> so, well, who's your supervisor? Mm. Uh, and I was used to this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you had to go up. And so I kept going up to the supervisor until I, I had the president of the company that agreed to meet me out here. Because I knew that he was going to see how important it was mm-hmm. to leave these trees. And he was sure that I was going to understand as a novice developer (laughs) that this could not work because all their equipment 
could only be done in this way, and they had to have a flat surface. And maybe they could pull it into 15 feet. Wow. Well, of course, what happens if I were to clear 15 feet, then I would have a ridge. So then you have to cut down more of the hill to angle it out. And all of a sudden, you have to cut down every tree that's out there. Yeah. there, there there's no savings of any trees. Right. And then no one understands how that's going to affect the stream below that we have saved all the natural. Right. And of course, that would happen there. And so this was a major deal. And I was up against the wall. I had to have power. Oh, sure. And there was nobody else that could put the power in for me because this is, you don't have any choices here. Right. I had remembered that two weeks before, mm -hmm. uh, there had been some interest in what we were doing here because of the charrette with the Rocky Mountain Institute. Okay. And a reporter with USA Today had come out and Ooh. taken a picture of the first bulldozer arriving in the trees. Huh. And we were on the cover of the second sh section of USA Today. Okay. And so I asked him if he had seen that, and he hadn't. And I said, well, you might want to look at it. And I said, you realize we've gotten a lot of press and we're going to, we're in focus about doing something different here, more mm -hmm. environmental. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to have to call the press and let them know why we're taking down all these trees. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he probably didn't like that. Two weeks later, they figured out how they could put the lines in. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that there was one team that could do what we needed to do oh. in boring, and it was a little more expensive. Oh, okay. But they have... I don't know how many teams that are used to doing the old trenching and then many more that do the pole and lines. Right. So this was just a specialty almost okay. to do it this environmental way, but they did figure out how to do it, but I didn't even know that was an option or what the issues were. So we had to go to extremes to where, oh my goodness. Right. And so... I won most of the battles mm -hmm. because I was just absolute. Right. Now, drinking water was mm -hmm. another issue. Okay. That's the one battle I lost. Okay. Because we had an entire plan to, you know, all of our houses were going to have um, stormwater drains like you do. So every roof, we were specifying what kind of roof materials okay. that every house could be. And they're not, you know, it's, it's what we have here. Yeah, it's tin, it's types, wood. It's, yeah. It, we didn't, we couldn't have asphalt, and we weren't going to allow asphalt anyhow. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so they were all these hard surfaces, natural mm -hmm. products would be your roofs. And you would collect all the rainwater in the mm -hmm. downspouts like we have. But yep. rather than going to stormwater, it would be collected. It would be in, in a system that took uh -huh. us back to a treatment center. And then we had a water tower planned on the hill over here. Oh. And we were going to treat all of our stormwater for drinking water, oh. and we had three well locations identified as backup. And so oh, wow. in the tower, we would have, I think it was three days, 72 hours of, of water supply at any time for uh -huh. the entire community in, in this system. Great. EPD decided that that was too small of a system for them to approve, and L Atlanta did not... Uh, want it because we were in their distribution system. And so this was taking potential future customers away from them. Right. So it's economic. It was an economic uh -huh. issue. So it was a, a, um, issue of, of, of both uh, monitoring mm -hmm. and economics from two different agencies mm -hmm. that were both mm -hmm. blocking me on this. Okay. So it, it was one I had to give up on. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's still a heartache that we did because we would have had really a great, drinking system. And, mm -hmm. and when we think of, of Georgia and, and the water wars and the concerns about water yeah. supplies, yet our rules don't allow us to do things more responsible to in conservation and, and what we're doing. Right. Uh, so that, that was one of the disappointing uh, there. Uh, it's interesting. Now, I know that there's a lot of alternative energy here. We don't really call it that. We just call it energy, geothermal and solar. <laughs> but most of the country probably thinks of it as an alternative. Tell me why you chose 
to put those in and, and how they're used. So that's a great subject, Monica, and it covers several things. Mm-hmm. One is is alternative energy is a great buzzword. Mm-hmm. What we should be talking about uh, in the nation is reducing our demand. Ah, that, 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 that's the great. first line of questioning. How do we reduce the demand mm-hmm. so that we're not uh, using the resources that we are? And your, your first line in that is, is certification only because it is a checklist on what we need to do to build better buildings that require less energy. Okay. LEED has done a great job mm-hmm. of educating corporate America. Mm-hmm on these principles and the economics of it. Now, now remember, when we started, uh, the first LEED building had not been certified. Right. Uh, this was uh, fairly an unknown concept that right. was just being developed. But here, here in Georgia, South Face had developed the Earthcraft program. Right. And so they were actually certifying houses at that point. Okay. So as we educated ourselves on that, we decided that that every house here should be certified. And this way we were putting a third party to require mm-hmm. all of our builders that built here to build under these uh, sustainable uh, practices. And, and can you tell me a little bit, I mean, we'll point people to South Face on the website, but tell me a little bit about what that means. Because I know LEED has specific things they well, do, it's, but it's, like how does Earthcraft work? It's very similar to LEED in the fact that there's a checklist of things and okay. they've changed the program through the years of mm-hmm. how you, what you have to do to meet it. But it's, you know, you you, you begin with what your, uh, your vapor barrier is, you know, What's mm-hmm. between the earth or where you're building mm-hmm. and, and your and, and your foundation? Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of uh, insulation? Well, how thick are your walls mm-hmm. and the insulation? What what are your windows? Mm. What's your air quality and exchange of air? Okay, and, and it's all these things to really the shell of the building. Okay. Now, if that is built tight and correctly, you reduce your energy demand by thirty to thirty five percent. That's incredible. So that's that's a big issue. So I felt, okay, whew, that's, you know, we're doing more than the average person if we do that. Then as I was becoming a student of all of these issues, I was intrigued with geothermal mm-hmm. in the energy, but what I was really interested in the fact that it was silent compared to all the air compressors we had. From a noise pollution standpoint, Be, sort well, of thinking. Yeah, well, as you, as you know, at the Daisy Courtyard was what we were dealing with then, and, 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 and you've got 12 units to an acre. So that's very dense. Oh, and there's, sure. they're, they're surrounded around a courtyard. And then there's the street on, on the side of one group and the woods on the other. And they literally had no back door. Mm-hmm. And even if I were put air compressors on everybody's roofs, imagine that courtyard with 12 mm-hmm. buildings yeah, with the, the air compressors. Were, there would be this constant yeah. grind mm-hmm. that, you know, m- many people, when they open their windows in the spring and fall, <laughs> rather than hearing birds, you hear all this. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I was becoming very aware of, uh, of how noise pollution really affects us and and where we are. And of course, I'd lived in quiet nature long enough that I was very conscious about this noise right. that we have just become mm-hmm. used to in the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my first interest in geothermal was the lack of noise. Uh-huh. Uh, but then uh, that reduces your HVA cost energy needs by 50% generally, which is another third of your overall mm-hmm. power bill. Yeah. So if you build it uh, certified, and if you put geothermal in, you've reduced your demand by 65, maybe 70%. Hmm. So at that point, it's a good time to talk about solar okay. and wind or what other. Then you could talk about alternative energy. Okay. Because you only need a third of whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And then the exciting subject that I'm looking forward to having in the future is then storage. Because then we're not dependent upon the grid, which is one of the most vulnerable things we have that right. not many people are talking I about. Know, so, it's too scary. So, so that's opening the, the door to a mm-hmm, lot of subjects. Mm-hmm. Now, six years ago, we were starting to be noticed by people in the energy field. And Bosch was looking for somewhere in the United States to build a model home 
to demonstrate how their various products could come together. Mm-hmm. And the governor of Georgia called, or uh, their office called, and, and wanted me to come talk to Bosch, that they were looking for that, and, and uh, they thought Serenby would be a great place as they were talking about um, various things in Georgia. Well, that led to Bosch deciding to choose Georgia or and Serenby as the mm-hmm. location for this house. Mm-hmm. Uh, we built that house under our Earthcraft certification. Geothermal from Bosch was mm-hmm. put in, and it's a 2,300-square-foot house. Mm-hmm. It had reduced the energy demand by the 70%. Okay. And so when they analyzed the solar panels, the roof was plenty large to, mm-hmm. to handle that, which is your first thing. And the cost was a third of what it would normally be because we'd reduced the demand. So Mm -hmm. we didn't need so much. And so they built that house and uh, we took 18,000 people, I believe, through it in an open house uh, period of time. And it was a great model for us. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that this was just so wonderful that everyone would want to do geothermal and solar. Of course. (laughs) <laughs> Bosch was so pleased with the fact that Serenby was a foundation that they could see a lot of the bigger pictures that they then chose to open their experience center here. Mm-hmm. And for five years, they brought executives from around the world for seminars and to understand what their various divisions could do together to build structures, mm-hmm. but to understand a lot of the other areas like water and and agriculture, Mm -hmm. things that they weren't involved with. So they they saw the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. But the disappointment to me was that with this great example, you could stand and watch the meter run backwards. (laughs) People still chose to put granite countertops in versus geothermal. Right. And I realized that people will not necessarily make those decisions for just money because we really don't think about the cash flow, Mm -hmm. or we don't really believe that it's going to be a savings. Right. And so we eventually formed our own geothermal utility, and now that is required. So now you have to have certified buildings, and you have to have geothermal as your source of of power for your HVAC systems. So we're, we're, we're moving forward. We have net zero houses, but you know, my dream in the future is that we can actually have a net zero community Mm. with storage Mm -hmm. capacity. And and, and I think that's all going to be available. The technology's there. It's, it's getting more affordable. And uh, I think we'll see a real change in that area. Yeah. I look forward to that. Another thing that always is fascinating to me, I, I live down in Grange, and down in Grange, we have two Gabian bridges, and most people don't know what that is. I didn't know what that was before I moved here, but because of the shape of the community, which it's based on sort of an omega or a horseshoe, and so that curvature, when you go across stream bed, you're going to build a bridge, ridge to ridge, you... Can't, you had challenges building a bridge, right? Like you couldn't just, something that a car could go over, not just a footpath. Tell me about a Gabian Bridge. Tell me why you built them. Well, so it's, it, it's this entire thing. So we're, we're bringing a lot of different disciplines to our land planning. Mm-hmm. So Phil Tab, who was our land planner, of course, mm-hmm. laid this out with the sacred geometry principles. Mm-hmm. And all of our communities are perfect omegas. Yeah. And so when the engineers wanted to straighten out a section of the road, of course, he said, oh, no, you can't do that. You <laughs> See, the, the perfect omega. So uh, the engineers weren't used to having that kind of a discipline. Mm-hmm. So then it came back, okay, well, if we have to keep it curved, we either, we have two choices. Mm-hmm. You put in a big concrete bridge mm-hmm. and curve it on top of a straight piece of concrete, so to speak. Um, okay. So it wouldn't all be road. It would be mm-hmm. pieces on each side, on the two sides, you mm-hmm. know, they're, uh, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't quite follow. Right. Or what standardly and what was in the engineer practice is let's just tear down 70 feet of trees on each side and okay. it would be an earthen embankment. Well, lovely. Just like the um, and just, people. <laughs> and that's what you see all over. Yes. You see that everywhere. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's the most economic way. You put you put a big culvert pipe in the stream so mm-hmm. the water flows through, and then you pile dirt on, and you have to embankment so it'll support the road. Mm-hmm. That's across America. Right. That's what you're used to seeing. And no trees. No trees, and then it costs a fortune to plant trees so that in 20 or 30 years, it doesn't look like this bearish, great pile of 
Sure. <laughs> well, of course, I wasn't going to allow that to happen. Yeah. So everybody goes back to the research table. And yes, there are these Gabion bridges and mm -hmm. these are Gabion, I mean, systems. Mm -hmm. And these are really, uh, think of, uh, of large cages filled with rocks is the best way to envision it. And then these all tie together and they're all engineers. So this holds up for, you know, it isn't like things rust out and all. And and you still have the pipe, but then also if you have a storm event, uh, mm -hmm. water can actually flow through them. Mm. Uh, so it's really environmentally. And and then because they're natural, mm -hmm. uh, grasses and things grow up on the sides as they're, as they're stacked. And so in Grange, where you mentioned, which was our first, we have two mm -hmm. yeah. at, uh, of these at Serenby, we were able to save trees within five feet of the, oh. of, of the road. And it's a beautiful bridge. And you... When you're on it now, you don't even think about it because you're you're intimately in the woods in this section yes. where you're crossing the mm -hmm. stream. And you look down and you see the beautiful stream. Mm -hmm. And, of course, now upstream, what, 200 feet, we have a pedestrian bridge that's just yes. beautiful. gorgeous. And uh, in the spring... You see all of the native azaleas in the various shades of pink that are twenty bloomed, to thirty yeah. feet tall, mm -hmm. and it's just it's just one of those special places where where nature was not disturbed, yet you have high density. That's where we have an apartment building 28 units right there. Mm -hmm. We have the dense Swan Ridge, but in between is this stream valley mm -hmm. that has not been touched. Right. And that includes the Gavian Bridge that you looked down on and that was all allowed. And oh, just great. imagine I know. how different that would be. I know. That's my walk to work right now. I get to walk across it every time. <laughs> so that sort of leads into a little bit more about stormwater. Like we talked about trying to capture it, but the way you handle it, you started talking about, you know, you, when you look on either side of that bridge and anywhere really as you're walking along the roads there's streams on either side it's like the creeks are still there and I can see them rushing by in fact I, I took a picture a video the other day again maybe we'll find it and put it on the website that's just what you see from your sidewalk so tell me how why I mean it's such a different way to walk through a community so once we realized we were not going to be able to capture the storm water for mm -hmm. our drinking uh, water source how do we deal with mm -hmm. with storm water I uh, had seen all these chain link muddy ponds yeah. that we see throughout development areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the experts at the time who had written a book, Bruce Ferguson, mm -hmm. at the University of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And so Bruce consulted with us on how we should do our stormwater, but said, you know, m most of this is done in third world countries because regulations are difficult in the United States oh. to take at the extreme. There are various levels, but okay. of course I wanted to go the most environmental, the, way, yeah. the most radical, sure. which seemed the most simple, nothing radical to me. And so what we have, if you see in, in the first community and throughout Serenby, the idea is to get the water off of our roads, which is where it's polluted, you know, in houses, but everywhere where stormwater is running, you want to detain it in natural nature as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we get it off as frequently as we can mm -hmm. and then into retention swell. So it's retention swells. Mm -hmm. And that is, is the key way. And so in Selborne, and when you walk down that center path, you don't even notice until you really look. And there's these swells, mm -hmm. uh, bioretention swells, and there's some pipes that run through them at different angles so that the mm -hmm. water seeps out. Mm -hmm. And then it, it naturally seeps slowly through the earth and all the plant matter that's there. So right. that by the time the streams, they're, they're, they're primarily cleaned. Right. Now, the old system for decades has been to put this in hard pipes. It, right. it was just a focus on getting stormwater off your property. Mm, and moving it. And moving it. Mm -hmm. But there was not thought about where you were moving it to. Mm -hmm. So it was constantly move it. Right. Move it to a retention pond if necessary. So, or you're collecting it from a ten, uh, retention ponds from the the mm -hmm. disturbed area or the hill, and then it goes in a hard pipe mm -hmm. somewhere. Well, that somewhere, somewhere yeah. is eventually a tributary. Right. And if you put stormwater in a hard pipe, it never has an opportunity to cleanse itself, and it builds up speed. 
Ah. So the, by the time it eventually comes out in a tributary, it's built up so much speed that it's going to do incredible damage. Uh. This is why the tributaries in most of our urban areas aren't thought about because they're such a mess, yeah. everyone's turned their back to Have them. So we don't even know where they are. No. Uh, or they've just been covered up until they hit a river and then do the pollution in the river. So we constantly have been moving that problem of discharge Down. away, uh, away, away from where we mm-hmm. actually live and out of sight. Wow. This is why, you know, Atlanta now is spending millions to clean up Proctor Creek uh, because uh, of this kind yeah. of thing. And because these are forgotten areas, huh. uh, through time people have tended to dump uh, they're used tires, they're used batteries, and so they really become more and more of a dump site so in our urban areas. It's very sad it's the way really we've, we the way we've allowed this to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was just adamant that we were going to do bioretention swells throughout mm-hmm. the community. And so if you walk through the center of Selborne, you don't realize it until you point it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're in Crossroads, you see how all the stormwater is daylighted right along the streets yeah. and by the sidewalks yeah. and, and those bioretention areas because there's a bit of a hill there, so mm-hmm. it's it, you know, uh, are rocks and it's all wildflowers, yeah. and, they're, and it's some of the most beautiful areas of Serenby, yeah, especially is. in spring. It, mm-hmm. it, it's just incredible. Uh, in Grange, where you were talking about, we've put a path right next to the bioretention, mm-hmm. and we have blueberries and figs and, and apple trees, mm-hmm. and it goes right by the school. That and mm-hmm. it goes right by the school, mm-hmm. and that's a good example of of how any urban city could really put, bring nature into every neighborhood is right. if we just thought about how the raindrop that falls on any house finds its way to the local tributary and to the local river. Mm-hmm. And imagine if those were greenways, we would have this vein system of green through our urban areas. Right. Um, and it would it would totally change how we, how we thought, how we felt. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I think it's one of the easiest things we could do because infrastructure in many of our cities, older cities, is, is breaking down and we're having to, to look at what we're going to do. But 18 years ago, Monica, I was way out on a limb. Right. I, they weren't going to permit me to do this. In fact, they didn't permit me. I had mm-hmm. to go ahead and do it. At least they had the wisdom not to cite me or shut me down. Right. Uh, and I found out it took five or six years to actually change regulations. Okay. Once everyone agreed it needed to be done. Okay. So many manuals, so many training. And you it's some of the things that frustrates right. me as I look which is the passion I realized we had to do all of this. Right. Well, now you have an example here that you can show other people that it works and that people will live. That's right. That's it. right. And so there are many examples now on stormwater around, around the country. So. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Um, next time we're going to talk about more what we call placemaking, what you, I should say you call placemaking, but um, really that's the next step in how to build a neighborhood. Now that you get all the infrastructure in, um, we'll talk more about a little bit more about the beauty, if you will. Good. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Serenby Stories. New episodes are available on Mondays. You can subscribe anywhere you listen to podcasts. For more details, visit our website, serenbystories.com.